Hello, I'm Dr. Ken Landau. Thanks for joining us. We're going to continue our discussion of erectile dysfunction, causes two in number. One is organic, the other is psychological. It was thought that psychological issues counted for maybe 80% of cases once upon a time. Now we think that it's maybe 10 or 20% of the cases. Emotional issues, psychological issues, well, fear, anxiety, depression, relationship problems performance anxiety, all of those. We know that people who have erectile dysfunction as far as psychological issues are concerned, they tend to develop the condition relatively suddenly, tend to still have morning and evening erections, still develop erections with sexual thoughts, just not erections that are capable of being used for sexual activities. We know that it's relatively short-lived for many people, we know that more commonly we have organic problems. Organic problems, for instance, central nervous system problems. A person could have Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease. A person could have a stroke. A person could have multiple sclerosis. A person could have a variety of spinal cord injuries. A person could have some sort of nerve injury because of surgery, maybe radical prostatectomy. A person could have a problem with nerves maybe because they fell and broke the pelvis. Autonomic nervous system imbalance causes that. We know that endocrine problems are very commonly discussed, but much less frequently actually involved. Most people think, well, geez, if you have erectile dysfunction, you just don't have enough testosterone. That's probably a minor component. It's definitely a minor component of the whole story. We know that androgens, male hormones, are important and necessary in order to cause sleep-related erections, but we know that visually stimulated erections are apparently not caused by having a lot of testosterone floating around. Testosterone is important because it helps regulate the enzymes that produce nitric oxide. Nitric oxide, very important chemical in the whole story of erections, and it also is important in the phosphodiesterase story, that's all related to the Viagra and the Cialis and the Levitra. We know that if a person has a deficiency of male hormone, then obviously a supplement is appropriate. However, the question is what constitutes inadequate amount of testosterone? And there's a lot of argument about this, but we do know that people who have a deficiency in testosterone are at higher risk for developing cardiovascular disease or dying of cardiovascular disease. So as you remember from our former discussion, there's a correlation between the whole story of erectile dysfunction and heart disease. Well, as far as testosterone functioning, we know that there's just no question you have to have some amount of testosterone. The question is, what is the appropriate amount? And the question is, is it testosterone or is it a chemical that's a derivative of testosterone, which is really more important, and it's called dihydrotestosterone. And that the dihydrotestosterone is made by an enzyme that's present in the prostate, among other areas. We also know there's another chemical that's manufactured in the brain, and it's called prolactin. And some people develop elevated levels of prolactin. And when that happens, you don't have any symptoms necessarily. When that happens, it's going to push down the level of testosterone. And when it pushes down the level of testosterone, then it's not infrequent to be associated with erectile dysfunction. Most of the people who have elevated levels of prolactin nowadays, most men, are taking the antipsychotic drugs, taking the drugs like Respridol and Zyprexa that you hear so much about, that were once upon a time used to treat only schizophrenia. Now they're being used to treat a whole number of conditions, probably in many cases inappropriately. So we have the hormones. We also have the vessels. We know that vessels are very important. We have to be able to open up the vessels, open up the arteries sufficiently to get the increased amount of flow of blood into the corpora cavernosa, those two cylinders in the penis that are very important, that cause the dilation, that cause the inflow, that cause the erection. So if you have some sort of an abnormality with the arteries, maybe you have ischemia, maybe you have some fibrosis and you can't open the arteries, maybe you have some problem with the veins and the veins won't close. So the blood goes in, but the blood comes out as fast as it's going in. Then we have a significant issue. Now, most of the time, 
when we have a vascular issue, an arterial issue, it's related to the usual culprits. It's either hardening of the arteries or obesity or cigarette smoking or your cholesterol's too high or you have high blood pressure. All of those, the common denominator is the cell that surrounds the vessel wall, we call it the endothelium, becomes damaged. That endothelium is extraordinarily important as far as producing the nitric oxide. Now, remember we said that the artery going to the penis, the penile artery, is extraordinarily small. It's no larger than the tip of this pen. That's going to be able to supply appropriate amount of blood. However, if those endothelial cells are not working right, then we have an issue. And as a matter of fact, we can have some issues locally within the penis, within the anatomy of the penis. We can have an excess of fibrous tissue. It's basically like a big callus inside the penis. It's something that we call Peyronie's disease, an increase in the connective tissue. And when we get that increase in the connective tissue, it can destroy the arteries, it can destroy the veins, and that's not an uncommon kind of condition. We also can have a variety of other problems. We can have problems with the foreskin that lead to erectile dysfunction. We can have the foreskin is too tight, so it can't be pulled back. We can have certain diseases of the skin, something called lichen sclerosis. We can have a variety of dermatitides, rashes, psoriasis. We can have fibrosis. We can have people taking certain kind of drugs. And the drug that's most frequently associated with erectile dysfunction, class of drugs, are the psychotherapeutic drugs, so the antidepressants. Even taking those selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors that are so prevalent in our society right now, drugs like Prozac and Zoloft, those drugs can cause issues. MAO inhibitors, a little less commonly used, can cause problems. Tricyclic antidepressants, these are drugs like amipoline, nortriptyline, pamelar, those kind of drugs can cause the problem. Effexor can cause the problem. We also mentioned drugs like Respirdol and Zyprexa. And a lot of people taking medicines for high blood pressure. It seems that the thiazide diuretics are probably the most common cause in the high blood pressure family. Also a problem with the old-fashioned beta blockers. The newer beta blockers don't seem to cause the problem, but also we have problems with those drugs that are used to treat prostate problems. And who gets prostate problems? Men 50, 60 years of age. Who gets impotence? Men 50, 60 years of age. Is there a correlation? You bet there is. On the other hand, if you have high blood pressure, taking an ACE inhibitor, very commonly used, take medicine like an ARB, angiotensin receptor blocker, a drug like Lasartan, very commonly used. Those drugs seem to be okay, the Cinepril, those kind of drugs. We also know that the newer beta blockers seem to be relatively okay. And in fact, the newer beta blockers might even help with erectile dysfunction, help treat the condition. There are other drugs that also cause erectile dysfunction, drugs like digoxin, used for heart disease. If you have Atrial fibrillation, you might get a medicine known as amiodarone, that can cause it. Spironolactone blocks that dihydrotestosterone production that we talked about, or the ability of it to work in the skin, work in the prostate, work in other areas of the body. We know that antiandrogens, men who have developed prostate cancer and maybe are taking some of the antiandrogens, or taking the LHRH agonists, those kind of drugs cause it. And so too, if you're being treated for gastroesophageal reflux, you have heartburn, eat the pizza and pop the tagamet, pop the ranitidine, they can cause erectile dysfunction. And so too can some of the recreational drugs, if a person is taking marijuana, now all of a sudden going to be phenomenally available, readily available, well, marijuana causes erectile dysfunction, and so too does cocaine. Now, we have an issue with the statin drugs. Those are the drugs that are used to reduce the cholesterol. Do they cause erectile dysfunction or treat erectile dysfunction? Well, the evidence isn't good either way, but if they're going to do anything, they probably are going to benefit people who have erectile dysfunction. They're probably going to help treat it because they're probably going to help maintain some of the arterial function. They're probably going to treat some of the endothelial dysfunction. Those are the cells that line the vessel 
and those cells seem to be helped and seem to produce more nitric oxide in those people taking the statins. Well, we said that one of the classes of drugs that could cause problems are the drugs that are used to treat enlargement of the prostate, benign enlargement of the prostate. We have the alpha blockers, alpha blockers like Flomax, they can sort of get in the way, but even more importantly are the 5-alpha reductase inhibitors, drugs like Proscar, drugs like Avidart, they cause a decrease in the libido in some people and they also cause erectile dysfunction. Then we have the iatrogenic causes of ED. The iatrogenic causes, causes that we in medicine are responsible for. Radiation therapy. You have the prostate cancer, you get the radiation therapy. Well, that can interfere with function and so too can the radical prostatectomy. Systemic diseases cause problems. So systemic diseases, you're just fat. Your body mass index is more than 25, more than 30. You've had an ileostomy or a colostomy. You have benign enlargement of the prostate. You have the lower urinary tract symptoms, difficulty starting the stream, difficulty emptying your bladder, all of those associated with erectile dysfunction, and so too lung disease, liver disease, kidney disease, high blood pressure. High blood pressure causes lots of problems. Cigarette smoking, obviously a significant issue, causes perhaps an increase in the incidence of erectile dysfunction of about 80% in current smokers, maybe 50% in past smokers. Question is, what can you do? Are there any kind of simple therapies? Well, one of the therapies is changing some of the lifestyle factors. Go out and exercise. The more you exercise, the less ED you're going to suffer. So it's estimated that maybe you can reduce the likelihood of erectile dysfunction or even treat erectile dysfunction, reduce it by about 30% if you simply go out and exercise, exercise appropriately. Other studies show that maybe you can reduce the likelihood of ED by 50% with high levels of physical activity. Aging causes ED. Aging causes it because you develop certain lifestyle habits, certain systemic diseases become more common in people as they grow older. That's why we say overall that probably about 40% of people age 40 are going to have erectile dysfunction and the incidence increases to about 70% in those people 70 years of age. Diabetes is a very common cause of ED. That can be reduced by appropriate exercise, appropriate diet, if you do that, you'll benefit yourself. Otherwise, we know that people who have diabetes, about 50% of them, after about 10 years, going to have erectile dysfunction. And as a matter of fact, erectile dysfunction might be the first sign of diabetes in about 12% of the people. Well, question is, what are we likely to do to make the diagnosis? Well, we rely on patient symptoms. So remember, the symptom of not being able to attain or to maintain an erection sufficient for sexual performance. That's how we diagnose the condition. And we know that the condition itself may require psychological assessment, may require physical assessment, and may require cardiology assessment. Now, we have a test that a person can take, and it's called the International Index of Erectile Function. And we have the short form and the long form. The short form is five questions, long form, 15 questions, or we have the sexual health inventory for men, five question inventory. And depending on what the person's score is, a person can be scored as having either normal sexual function or mild, moderate, or severe erectile dysfunction. And it's important because that's the scale that we're going to use to decide whether our therapies are of any benefit. Simple laboratory tests are all that are needed. So for instance, we want to make sure you're not diabetic, so we get a fasting blood sugar. We want to make sure if you're over age 50 that your lipids, your cholesterol isn't out of whack. So we get a blood cholesterol. Testosterone probably doesn't have to be uh, uh, obtained in most men. If we do check for testosterone, free testosterone is probably much more important than total testosterone. We can get some other kind of hormones too, assess perhaps LH or perhaps prolactin, all of those morning kind of hormone evaluations. Cardiovascular function may be important. Once upon a time, people were 
of the belief that we ought to do a penile Doppler examination to test the artery, see how big the artery is, see how the veins were performing. We did that because we gave a person an injection of medicine that caused dilation of the vessels, or we gave a person a test of Viagra. But now it's thought that that's not very important. And as a matter of fact, the idea of putting a stent in the artery came and went. That was not a very good story in medicine. Once upon a time, we also used to put a series of stamps or something else around the penis and see if a person was able to attain an erection during the course of sleep. We call that a nocturnal penile tumescence test. Now that's basically just for history. Cardiovascular testing appropriate in those people who were at high risk, of course. Physical demands of sex are relatively small. Basically, it's like getting the heart rate up to 120 or 130, or maybe the blood pressure up to 170. If you're able to walk a mile in 20 minutes, or if you're able to walk up two flights of stairs, you probably can have sex, so you would be considered at relatively low risk. Therapeutic tests to see if you're able to improve, as I said, two separate ways. One, we can inject into the penis with some chemical, alprostadil, that's relatively common kind of medicine available, not very frequently used, but commonly available. And if a person responds, we can say, aha, that's all there is, no further workup necessary, no hormones, no anything else. Or if the person is given a dose, a test dose to Viagra or any of the other medicines, then if the person responds appropriately, then we can say we don't have to do anything more. So how do we treat people? Well, we have a variety of methods to treat people. So we have lifestyle modification, and we have the drugs in the family of Viagra. We have injections into the penis. We have testosterone that overwhelmingly isn't appropriate. We have a suction device that can be used and then we have some psychiatric treatment for some. So what are the lifestyle modifications? Lifestyle modifications are obviously relatively straightforward. Stop smoking if you smoke cigarettes. If you drink, well, cut down on the amount of drinking. Certainly no more than one or two beverages at most a day. Weight control, if you're over a BMI of 25 or 30, go lose some weight. Physical activity can reduce the likelihood of erectile dysfunction by 30%. That's very significant. We know that if you go on a diet or if you treat your diabetes, that can take a relatively long time to work, a couple years actually. We know from some insurance data that of those people who are taking treatment for erectile dysfunction right now in the United States, of six million men who are being treated, well, about 75% of the men are on the drugs in the family of Viagra, about 30% of the people, probably mostly inappropriately being treated with testosterone. How do we arrive at the most appropriate therapy for an individual? Well, we can arrive at the most appropriate therapy because the patient says, hey, I want to take Viagra. Or the patient might say something else. Or maybe it's the partner. Maybe it's the physician preference because of cost reasons or because of other medical issues that a person has. We have to make certain that a person is appropriately healthy enough for sex. We have to consider all of those other sorts of issues, but the most important are appropriate lifestyle changes, because if we change the lifestyle, we know that some of those cells that make the surroundings of the vessel are going to increase, and that obviously is exceptionally important. So what are the treatments? In some cultures, people like to take herbs. Do herbs work? Nope, they sure don't. They don't have any significant function, but the ones that are very popular are the ginseng, the yohambin, and then another one called butea. And they're all plants, they're all roots. So do they seem to work? And the answer is no, they really don't. There's a lot of talk about them, but the talk is more than the evidence. So if we talk about ginseng, well, there are different kinds of ginseng. There are Asian ginseng, American ginseng. Most people agree American ginseng doesn't work. Asian ginseng seems to do something, if anything, is going to work. Does it really? Eh, probably not. Butea superba, that's another herb 
does it work? We don't really have any evidence that it does, but it's popular, and Yohan Bean, well, supposedly is going to increase the sexual response, but we don't really have any good evidence. As far as medicines are concerned, we know that probably about three-quarters of the people are going to be taking one of the pills in the Viagra family, about a third of the people are going to be taking the testosterone, and one percent of the people are going to be using either the injections or inserting a pellet of the same kind of chemical inside the urethra or using a different kind of an injection. If we talk about the injections, the injections with vasoactive substances that are going to increase one of the chemicals, so instead of the cyclic GMP that's associated with the Viagra story, these injections are associated with the cyclic AMP story. And they work. There's just no question they work. But it's very difficult to get people to go and inject a chemical into their penis. Inject is the operative word with a small needle, a needle a little bit bigger than an insulin needle. You get an erection within 10 minutes, and that's independent of desire. You give yourself a shot, you're going to get an erection. You shouldn't do it more than three times a week. And it's probably effective in somewhere between 70 and 90 percent. Erection, the question is, is it going to be prolonged? Not usually. There is a, a more of a problem with prolonged erections with injection than without, than with the uh, oral pills. Well, the medicines that we have available are either alprostadol, or we have papaverine, or we have fentolamine, or we have another one called vasoactive intestinal peptide. And all of them seem to work, either the alprostadol by itself, or if it doesn't work, as well as you'd like, you can add another chemical, and you can have a mixture of two chemicals or even three chemicals. Side effects are relatively few. There's some scar tissue that may build up. There's obviously an issue of pain. Nobody wants to give themselves a shot in their personal part. That's uh, probably not nearly as, as appropriate as taking a pill. There's priapism, the prolonged erection, more than two or three or four hours. That can occur, but it's relatively rare. And anybody who gives themselves a shot of a vasoactive substance, a substance that works on the vessels, well, they can develop either low blood pressure or they can actually faint. And we know that papaverine probably has the most elevated incidence of erections lasting more than four to six hours, but we can draw the blood out, we can inject another kind of chemical that constricts the blood vessels, or we can even sometimes just go out for a brisk walk. That can stimulate the sympathetic nervous system, and then maybe we can get rid of the problem. Suction devices, we can put the penis in a cylinder, a plastic cylinder, evacuate the air, and in doing so, we cause a negative pressure, so the blood flows in, the blood flows in, and then we can take a little rubber band that's on the outside of the cylinder, push it around the penis, and then we keep the blood inside the penis. Now, we haven't dilated those spaces that are normally going to be associated with an erection. Haven't done that at all. All we've done is cause negative pressure, the blood flows in, just like a suction blister. And when that happens, people can have sexual activity. Now, the problem is that it's not, again, very appealing. It takes a lot of time. It requires a highly motivated patient. The satisfaction rate is relatively good, somewhere around 50, 60, 70 percent. Side effects are relatively infrequent. But most people don't enjoy that. Well, then there's implant. And an implant, surgical implant, if everything else fails, it's something that you could consider. But it alters the penile tissue so you never can go back and take a pill. Well, there are two kind of implants. There's the semi-rigid implant. Semi-rigid implant is never fully erect. It's difficult to conceal. And Fortunately, it's easy to do the surgery, and it seems to last longer than the other type. And the other type is an inflatable implant. The inflatable implant is associated with a reservoir, so there are multiple areas that can go wrong. It's associated with the reservoir, and you have to pump the fluid from one area of the groin to another, and then it gets into the penis, and when it's in the penis, then it increases the ability to have sex. Well, these things seem to work, and they work very well. 
relatively few side effects, infection, a couple percent, malfunction, maybe 20% of the time, but satisfaction rate probably about 70, 80% of the time, so significant. Well, there are some surgeries on the arteries, but those have fallen out of style, the stents and, and, and surgical reconstruction. Testosterone therapy for erectile dysfunction it probably has a limited role, interestingly. We know that if there's a marked reduction in the amount of bioavailable testosterone in the system, then yes, maybe testosterone is appropriate, but most people don't have the issue. We know that testosterone by itself is rarely helpful. If it is helpful, it's going to be psychological for the overwhelming majority of the people. But we know that low testosterone is associated with some cardiovascular problems, higher incidence of cardiac events, higher level of cholesterol, higher level of LDL more stiffening of the artery, more calcification of the artery. Certainly, we do have to pay attention to testosterone. Testosterone is important in the sexual drive and sexual desire, not necessarily in the visual erections, but in the sleep-related erections, but that's not when you have sex. It's associated with the nitric oxide production. We can test for the amount of important testosterone. We can do a simple blood test. Testosterone is important as far as the brain or the nerve activity, the pelvic nerves are concerned. It's important as far as the corpora cavernosa are concerned. It helps regulate some of the nerve function. We know that testosterone tends to decrease as a person gets older. Question is, is that decrease normal or is it associated with disease? Disease in this case, erectile dysfunction. Well, testosterone is one of those kind of chemicals that we have to be very careful of. Certainly, if you have a high blood count, if you have a lot of red blood cells, because we know that testosterone is going to push the red cells up, that would increase the risk of a stroke, potentially, so we don't want to do that. Or if a person has uncontrolled heart failure or has fluid retention, we don't do that. Now, the most important advance recently in the whole concept of erectile dysfunction comes with the phosphodiesterase inhibitors. That's Viagra and Cialis and Levitra. And these drugs are phenomenally important as far as a therapy is concerned. They were, they came on the market, Viagra came on the market in 1998. It was a chemical that stimulated the role of nitric oxide and nitric oxide important in the relaxation of the smooth muscle so that we could get more blood flowing to the penis. And now we know, in spite of the fact that it was just for erectile abnormalities when the drugs were first marketed, we know that they do an awful lot in excess. So they can help dilate the lung arteries, lung vessels, and, and that's being used now for certain lung diseases, other systemic diseases, blood vessel diseases, Raynaud syndrome. We know that it helps the heart, it increases the myocardial contractility, it decreases the stiffness of the arteries, it improves endothelial function, improves the function of the blood vessels themselves, of the arteries. And we know that now those drugs are being used for men who have benign enlargement of the prostate. Well, we know that these drugs have to do with the amount of nitric oxide that's going to be released from the endothelium. We know that the nitric oxide is the most important neurotransmitting substance inside the penis as far as the erectile function is concerned. We know that these drugs are going to increase the score, that erectile function score, by more than anything else. We know that it's going to, therapy with Viagra or Cialis or Levitra, going to increase the score by about seven and a half to 10 points, as opposed to maybe lifestyle changes going exercise, that could increase it by about three points. Taking testosterone might increase it by only about two points. So we want to inhibit an enzyme known as phosphodiesterase 5, PDE5. And that's what the chemicals in the body will do if we give them enough time to act, and that's sort of how the Viagra acts. It's a long, complicated story, and, and it has to do with getting the right amount of calcium in the body, 
getting in the cell, intracellular from extracellular space. But let's leave it at that. Let's say that the drugs that are commonly used, the three originals, Viagra first, then we have Levitra and Cialis, and now we have a new one called Stendra. Then we have some that are available only in Korea and Asia. We have more coming to the market probably within the next several years. They work in about 65-70% of the cases. They all have about, even though they're advertised as being different, they all have about the same duration of activity. If you say that they don't work, you should take it four times at least before you say that the drugs don't work. And we know that they're going to increase the sexual performance, but they're not going to increase your libido. We know they're also going to be able to shorten the time period between sexual activity. So a man who has an orgasm will then develop a flaccid penis and it will become unresponsive for a certain period of time. We call that the refractory period. It also, those drugs also give a person better ejaculatory control. Well, you can take the drugs in two ways. You can take them either on demand, in other words, you take them just once when you're going to have sexual activities, you say, aha, it's Thursday night at 8 o'clock and I think the wife and I are going to have sex, so I'll take a pill, take a pill in anticipation by maybe an hour. Well, that means that you have to have a lack of spontaneity and you're required to take a drug and the drug has to be taken at the appropriate time. On the other hand, more recently, uh, proved in Europe first, the European Medicine Agency, in 2007, said, why don't you just take the drugs on a daily basis? Just take, and the one that got the approval was Cialis, and if you take Cialis every day, that means you don't have to worry about the spontaneity. You take a low dose, two and a half, five milligrams, but there's a problem with the cost, and, and if you're not having sex but once or twice a week, well, is it appropriate to take a drug all of the time? Well, there's some contraindications. There are people who should not use these kind of drugs. And that occurs in people who are taking nitroglycerin or any nitroglycerin, nitrate kind of drug. So it could be isosorbide or there are certain drugs available, not too much in the United States, somewhere in the United Kingdom and Canada, that, that also cause significant problems. We have to be careful with the alpha blockers, the drugs that people take like Flomax for urinary problems because of an enlarged prostate. And also you have to be a little careful if you're taking some of the rhythm drugs. So you're taking quinidine or amiodarone or sodalol, or maybe you have a congenital prolonged QT interval that your cardiologist would tell you. Then you shouldn't take the drugs and you shouldn't take the drugs if you have unstable angina or if you have hepatitis or kidney failure or if you've recently had a heart attack or a stroke. But interestingly enough, people who take the drugs Levitra and Viagra and Cialis, when they're followed, they don't have an increased incidence of either heart-related disease or death from heart-related disease. So the drugs seem to be relatively safe. Do they have some side effects? Yeah, but not really terribly problematic. And as a matter of fact, after you've taken the drugs for a couple weeks, the side effect profile tends to go down. The side effects are headache and maybe 10-15% of the people. Maybe you have some flushing, some dilation of the blood vessels maybe up to 10% of the people, maybe you have some shortness of breath. Again, very small percentage of people. Some people get runny nose, interestingly. If you take Viagra, you might have some issues with your hearing. There's a question about blue distortion of color. And then there's a question about blindness. Well, we just found several years ago, there's a condition called as non-arteritic ischemic optic neuropathy. And that's associated with sudden onset of blindness. And it occurs sometimes in people who are taking these drugs. Is there any relation? Well, it's not established whether there is or isn't. But a person has to be a little careful. Other things that we know? Well, sometimes people take the drugs and they don't respond. Who doesn't respond? Well, people who have uh, diabetes, especially poorly controlled diabetes or diabetes associated with significant complications or people who have severe neurologic problems, severe vascular problems, they don't seem to do well. We call failure, again, failure on four consecutive attempts to take the drugs that they don't seem to work. And if they don't, we know that you could change to a different drug in the same family. So you could go from Viagra to Cialis if you would like. That might be associated with improvement. But 
even so, we know that there are other therapies. There's ejection therapy. We know that about a third of the people are going to stop taking the drug even though they have improved directions, but they just don't like taking the drug. They're not satisfied. The experience, either the patient or the family member, isn't good. We know that if you're going to take these drugs, you should probably take them only once a day, no more. You should probably take them about an hour before you're going to have sex if you're taking the on-demand drugs. Drug is probably going to last about four hours and requires sexual arousal. Remember I said with the injection, you will get an erection, no question. That occurs just because of the shot. With these drugs, with the uh, Viagra, Cialis, and Levitra, you have to be sexually stimulated in order for them to work. And as soon as you have your orgasm, then you will have detumescence. The penis will become flaccid. Well, with these drugs, we're going to increase the satisfaction level by a significant amount. Remember, seven and a half to 10 points on the ejection I mean, I'm sorry, on the erection uh, function score. Well, if you're going to take either Levitra or Viagra, you have to be careful and not take them with fatty food. If you take them with fatty food, you're going to decrease the absorption, the duration of action of these drugs. For the most part, they're somewhere around four to six hours they'll last in the system. If you take the Cialis, it can last as long as 36 hours. They have various doses. Obviously, you have to take the correct dose. We know that a lot of people like to take the daily, not the on-demand, not the once every once in a while, but the daily dose. It's a smaller dose, about the same expense, but it seems to be superior if a person is going to engage in sexual activities more frequently, seems to work somewhat better and seems to, at least according to some people, have fewer side effects. And in addition, we know if you take the drug on a regular basis, remember we said that these drugs can be used for cardiovascular disease and for blood vessel diseases and for arterial diseases. Well, they seem to help the heart and, and maybe help a variety of other structures if you take them on a regular basis that you wouldn't have if you took them just on demand. People are afraid if you take something all the time that the drug will become less effective. That's not the case with this. Well, what do we have to worry about as far as non-response is concerned? Well, if the person is not getting a good response to taking Viagra, Cialis, or Levitra, maybe they're taking it with food, except for the Cialis. That doesn't seem to make any difference. Or maybe they're not taking it at the right time. Maybe they're not being sexually stimulated. But we do know that if you exercise on a regular basis, then you seem to improve the ability of these drugs to work. And in some people, it might be appropriate to take uh, therapy with testosterone. Could be the injection, could be the patch, could be the topical medicine. And if a person is taking the drug and it doesn't work, and they're taking it on demand just once every once in a while, it's appropriate to consider changing to on a daily basis. And if a person takes it on a daily basis, those drugs seem to work a little bit better. And as an added benefit, sound kind of like one of those commercials, those infomercials, as an added benefit, it seems that for men who have prostate issues, that these drugs significantly improve prostate function or improve bladder function so people can urinate better. And people don't have the same kind of symptoms. So for the lower, lower urinary tract symptoms that people have, the urgency and the frequency, it may well be significantly improved by taking the drug on a daily basis, so taking the Cialis. Well, all said, we know that there are a variety of PDE enzymes, phosphodiesterase enzymes. It seems that the principal one that the drugs that we're just mentioning work on is the PDE5. And they're inhibitors of the PDE5. And the PDE takes away some of the important ability of the chemicals in the body for those muscles to work. So we also know that there's some similarity between the different PDEs. So PDE5 and PDE1 and PDE2 and 3. And we have some spillover. And PDE6 is in the retina. And that's why some people get the bluish 
tinge to everything they see, or sometimes they get some sensitivity to light or some blurred vision. And we know that PDE1 is in the blood vessels, so we know that some people who take these drugs are going to get a variety of other symptoms, the blood pressure changes. We know that there are new drugs in the family coming to market all the time. We talked about one of them. Medically named uh, Vanifil, and this drug marketed as a better alternative. In effect, they're all about the same. Price is a major issue with these drugs. Price is horrendous, price is ridiculous, and price is not reflected in the cost of making the drug. It's reflected in what the drug company has decided to charge. So if you want 10 pills, if you want 10 pills of Viagra, 100 milligrams is going to cost you somewhere between 400 and 480 dollars for 10 pills. In other words, about 40 bucks a pill. If you take Levitra, you take the 20 milligram pill, you get 10 of them, going to cost you again about 400 dollars, 40 dollars a pill. If you take Cialis, well, if you take the 20 milligram pills, it's going to cost you somewhere around 480 dollars. If you go on a daily basis, and you take the five milligrams, you take five milligrams once a day for a month, that's only going to be $250, might be a bargain. And the other one, the Stendra, that's the newest drug in the family, it's about the same, it's about $35 a pill. So all in all, we have a lot of therapies, we have a lot of other therapies that are going to be coming down the road, and in fact, for some people, it might be appropriate to take a high blood pressure pill, maybe it's going to be one of those ACE inhibitors like lisinopril, or maybe it's going to be an ARB type drug relative of the ACE inhibitor. Maybe you're going to take a drug like Lasartan. They help a different pathway. And then we know that in a significant number of men, maybe some testosterone, or maybe even the active form of testosterone. Maybe that dihydrotestosterone, as far as a patch is concerned, might be appropriate. And we know that in Canada and Israel, they're using the same kind of lithotripsy to break up the plaque in the penis or in the arteries that they do for kidney disease, kidney stones. Then we have a variety of potassium channel inhibitors and other drugs in the family that are coming to the fore hopefully in the relatively near future, that are going to give people more of an opportunity to improve their erectile dysfunction. Thank you for watching. Back again next week, another topic.